Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shelby smith to you with Arkansas Department of Agriculture, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Um, welcome to the Risk Informed Decision Making Track. Um, before we get started real quick and start with our first presenter, I would like to make you aware of the chat feature that is to the right of your screen. Um, please place any questions you may have during a presentation in that chat feature, and we will address them at the end of each presentation in the Q&A section. To get started with our first presentation this afternoon, we have Tracy Friend. She's an emergency manager at AECOM. And today, Tracy will be discussing the factors that influence homebuyers' flood risk perception. And to Tracy, we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Friend, and I will be sharing with you my graduate research project titled Bounded Rationalism and Hazard Prone Areas. This was a pilot research project done with a very small sample base to see if there was enough information, data, or unanswered questions to do a larger research project. And so as we get into that, I'll tell you a little bit more about those who participated in this research. So first we will start. I was a student at Georgetown University, and we will talk about the theory of this project first. So the theory that this project is based upon is bounded rationalism. Basically what that means is people can only make decisions based upon the knowledge that they have. And so as I work in the flood risk map program, I wanted to understand why were people living in flood prone areas. And um, Ripley and their research talks about risk analysis and how humans analyze risk and we analyze it in two different ways intuitive and analytical and most of the time we analyze risk intuitively not analytically so the questions that I had as I wanted to interview people whose homes had flooded were these questions first did they even consider flood risk when they were looking for a home Second, what information was available to them as they were looking for a home? Third, how did they comprehend that information? And fourth, having experienced a flooding event, how now have their actions changed? So we'll get into that a little bit further here. So a research project had to cover these areas um, a literature review. And the methodology I used beyond the literature review was unstructured interviews. That means I asked open-ended questions and did not give them any answers to choose from. We did a stratified sampling, which we'll talk about in just a minute, and particip participatory research. So Gilbert White, a famous risk analysis, talks about knowledge and how it's flawed because of ignorance. So let's look into that just a little further. First, the literature review featured many different types of literature that I looked at to understand, one, the information was out there, and two, had people's flood risk perception ever been researched before? And then how did we communicate flood risk to the public? So these are some of the ways that I looked through the literature to understand as I went to ask these questions. Second, I did unstructured interviews. Again, we. I spoke of earlier, an unstructured interview is an interview where I ask an open-ended question. We had 24 questions. I interviewed people that lived in nine states, and we had a total of 14 participants. And as this was a pilot study, it was deemed sufficient to move forward. So a stratified sampling means you choose who participates in the study. Um, first, to meet the criteria to participate in the study and to be asked these unstructured questions, they had to own a home. Second, that home had to have flooded within the last 10 years. And third, they had to have a minimum of a high school education. About 90% of the folks actually had a college education, and I had a few with master's degrees. So if you think about that, what we were trying to identify was were social vulnerabilities a feature in them choosing to purchase and to live in a special flood hazard area or a high hazard area. So a little bit of background as I looked for my research project, I've done a lot of community work and I worked with a lot of the public. And as such, the people that I've worked with 
don't want to be a part of disasters, don't want to put themselves at risk, and actually want to contribute to solutions. These are some quotes of some of the folks that I've heard as I worked. One of my last disasters was the California wildfires. And in the middle is a little girl with a dress. And this happened during December in 2017. And instead of her birthday, she went and collected donations for those in the fire. And this is her at the warehouse with me at night, distributing all, um, I think she had two uh, pickup truck loads filled of goods. And she was so happy that this was her birthday present. So my experience with the public is, one, they're not ignorant, and two, they wouldn't put themselves in harm's way by choice. So moving on, the first question, what flood risk information is available? So we'll go first to legal. So interesting, this was a study done. And these are grades, everyone in every state in red has a none, no policies for flood risk disclosure. But in actuality, every state does have risk, flood risk disclosure in their laws. However, every single state has a different way in which these, this information should be disclosed. So interesting to note that bit. Second, the public information is varied based upon number one, a home buyer looking for flood risk information, and two, based upon their knowledge. So we'll look a little bit into the public information that's available to the um, public as they're looking to buy a home. The first one is, first, properly disclosure. So it's varied, dependent upon the state. It's also dependent upon the knowledge and experience of the realtor, and it's dependent on the status of the seller, meaning where are they in the process. Some states have it 10 days out, some days have it two days out, um, but again, everyone is varied. Um, as I interviewed the participants in this research, I asked them how they found out about their flood risk, and then I asked them, who they would trust most to learn about flood risk. And it was interesting to see the differences. Most folks um, learned about it from their lender. However, most of them said they would trust their realtor to learn about this information. So again, just information as, as we think about who's in a flood zone area and why. So the historical information that the um, interviewees as I asked them where they found their flood risk information. These are some of the areas where they can find out. They can find out through the public records, they can find out through verbal history, and they can find out through structural clues. Is it on stilts? Does it have water damage? But these are historical information that could be available if they looked for flood risk information. What was interesting was how many of the participants actually learned of flood risk by talking with their neighbors um, and being familiar with the neighborhood. Quite a number of these folks were already familiar with the neighborhood and were looking for other homes within their neighborhood. And so they were aware of the flood risk in that neighborhood because of those information. So new ways to learn of flood risk that are here now are first a website created by Texas A&M University. But at the time of this research project was a year ago when I finished, there were only five cities and that's three states that had this flood risk information on their website. Now the state of North Carolina actually has a pretty nice system. You can put in an address and a zip code and find that information out. But it's all very technical and we'll talk about that just briefly. Um, there are some flood floodplain training to realtors available, which I think is a great idea if you remember that most of those who bought their home said that they would trust their realtor with flood risk information. And last, as I completed my research on this in June of 2019, um, Open FEMA created their site here. And this allows you to search all flood risk, flood insurance claims back to the 1970s. However, as you look at these for sources of public information, the public FEMA site cannot be searched by address, 
nor can it be searched by Excel, but you need special software to download the copious amounts of data that has been anonymized to find out the flood claim history on those properties. So next, there is information available now, we've established that, but how do these people understand this information? So if you remember, we qualified these folks to be participate in the research because they had flooded. So we wanted to understand how they understood that information. So um, my first question and the original design of this graduate research was, how much did you understand your flood map? After I asked that about two or three participants, I realized I had to alter that question. And that question had to be altered to, have you ever seen your flood map? So looking at that, I want you to make a mental note and write down real quick, what percentage of participants do you think had seen a flood map of their home? Now take in mind that every single person interviewed for this research has flooded. The answer was 64%. So 64% of people who have flooded still have not seen a flood map of their home. Flood zone. So I asked, did they know where they, what flood zone they were in? So 12% didn't even know if they were in a flood zone. Again, they have flooded, but they still don't know if they're in a flood zone. The percentages get worse. When 40% don't know what flood zone they are in. And then the worst statistic was when I asked them how their flood risk was presented to them when they first purchased their home, I asked, and this one I did give them options, I said minimum or a minor risk, a medium risk, or a high risk, and I asked them to choose between those three. 92% said their flood risk had been presented as a minor risk. So. This is a fun little graphic. Let me change a little background so you can see some statistics here. In the 100-year flood zone, the special flood hazard area, as we call it professionally, 77 of the participants I asked, could you define what a 100-year floodplain means? 77% thought they knew what it meant. But when I asked them to define it, 64% of that 77% weren't accurate in their definition. More importantly, when I asked, could you define what a 100-year flood zone or flood plain means, 12% would not even answer the question. Their response to me was something to the line of, I have no idea, don't even ask me. So again, these folks have flooded, and yet they still can't accurately define the flood zone that they live in. So this little word cloud that you see here is 24 different ways within my research that we categorize a special flood hazard area. If we have such a large percentage that can't define what a 100-year flood zone is, and we call it in 24 different ways, how is the public to understand what we're telling them? And this was significant to me um, nine months into my research, and I'm specifically researching flood zones, flood risk, flood hazards. Nine months in, I found this fact, which, and that was for those that live in a 100-year flood zone, a special flood hazard area, for their 30-year mortgage when they purchase their home, they have a 26% chance of flooding. The question I ask you is, if we told them that when they looked at the house, would they have considered their flood risk just a little bit differently? So availability bias is the tendency to rely upon immediate examples when evaluating an option. We know, I, I heard on the radio actually the other day uh, down in southern Florida that Hurricane Andrew was 20 years ago and that the, they, most of that generation is gone. It's more of a transient nature. 
and they won't remember how dangerous a hurricane is. So if our people have flooded, how will that affect how they make their decisions? And as home buyers who've never experienced flooding, what availability of information do they have to make an informed decision? So next, so they flooded, we've seen what information is available. We've seen what they know about the flood zones that they lived in. Now we wanted to know, based upon their experience, has things changed? Will they make dif different decisions? Again, Gilbert White, his theory is, man is limited by the extent of their knowledge. So these folks have knowledge. What are they going to do with it? So I ask questions into the future to understand. So among the 24 questions, I asked these two questions, trying to figure out what has their experience done to change their knowledge and their actions to mitigate flood risk. The first question I asked was about future purchases. The second question I asked was about no mitigation actions. Now, if you look at these two questions, and if you think about the answers to them for yourself, they should be quite similar. One is asking how to minimize risk, and the other one is, what mitigations do you know about? They should be quite similar. The difference between these two questions, the key difference is the words. The second question asks about mitigation actions. The first one is talking about something they would own and how would they minimize risk. You would think minimize risk would be a little bit more complicated than mitigation, but here are the results. When I asked them about how would you minimize risks to a home they would potentially own in the future, most of them said they would elevate. And only one person said insurance, and that's for a future home. When I asked them, what mitigation actions are you aware of, that's here in the present, no one stated insurance and mechanical, and when I say mechanical, most of them were referring to um, generators and sump pumps, or structural, those tied. So there is a difference. Uh, they were not as similar as I thought that they would be. Thinking about this, um, I, I was quite surprised when I asked that first question. If the future home that you desire is in a flood risk area, what would you do? One third vehemently, first thing out of their mouth said, I would not buy. Now remember, I did not give them options for this question. These were open-ended. And yet one third said I would not buy with the knowledge that they had now and with the knowledge, the future knowledge that they would be in a special flood hazard area. So I did some math because, you know, graduate projects have to have math in them. And we found that there's an estimated 11 million homes in SFHAs. Now, if we took my small sample study of one third would not purchase if they knew their home would be in an SFHA, that's approximately three million, almost three and a half, that would not live in these areas. The other thing I wanted to demonstrate was I asked them, what did they look for when they bought a home? I asked them first at the beginning of the interview, what did you look for when you were looking to buy your home? And then I asked them at the end of the questions, for your future home, what will you look for? So as you can see in the original question, what did you look for when you bought your home, the one that has now flooded? No one looked for flood risk. Location was pretty high on everybody's list, though, <laughs> for, the future, for the past purchases. But when I asked, what would you look for in a future home? Gilbert's white theory proves true. The second highest thing that they would be looking for is their flood risk. So their actions have changed. Now, I will tell you, and I did not capture this here, but I will tell you, incidentally, the majority, probably 80 to 85%, still had no idea of where they would go to find that flood risk information. But they were all pretty positive 
they would be looking for it. So I wanted just to briefly touch on flood insurance. This is one of the new mitigation measure, measures that we have in the moonshots is to increase flood insurance. And I want to just to highlight that it's not thought of, at least by my small sample study, as a mitigation measure. Uh, it's the cost is difficult for some, especially those that live in coastal areas. They have that availability bias, meaning they've not flooded before, and so why would they even consider it? They don't perceive their risk, and so they don't think they need it. And then for those who had purchased it, I think I had just a handful, it was very difficult to use. So flood insurance, we have some growth to do to begin that as a part of the population's thought of mitigation. So in conclusion, our disasters are increasing. They're increasing, see, increasing in, desires, in size and they're increasing in frequency as well as monetary value. So this isn't going away. When we look back over those original questions I asked in my research, is flood risk a factor when purchasing a home? And the answer is no not for the general home buyer. As a matter of fact, it was not for all those that I interviewed for their home that did end up flooding. Was what flood risk information is available? It's very limited actually, and it's not even known that it's out there, nor, especially in the case of some of them, is it easily accessible? What is the comprehension level of the available information? Quite poor. And having experienced the flooding event, has this changed their actions? And that answer is limited. So my recommendations from the research project is they is the public has a role in the development and the issues with the National Flood Insurance Program. But the public needs more information. This is a risk they are unaware of. Um, that flood risk information needs to be more readily acceptable, accurate, and it needs to be able to be comprehended. And that after a disaster and after a flooding event is an opportune teaching moment to one, show them their flood map, and two, to explain what that means, especially the probability. As we remember, 64% had not seen or could understand and define where they lived in the flood zone. So as I was finishing the graduate project up, I was reading another book and I came across this proverb, this verse from Proverbs, and I think it quite applicable to our flood risk information and the perception of the public, and that is wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. With that, here are some of the references from my research project that were used in this research presentation. And I will now turn it over to questions. Thank you everybody for letting me share my research and I'd be happy to discuss this further with you. And special thanks goes to AECOM, whom I was employed with and am currently employed with through the course of my graduate studies and for helping me and making connections to find more information. Thank you all. Well, Tracy, um, after sitting through that, that was a very informative presentation, I will say, um, and it was quite eye-opening to flood risk um, disclosure. We did have a couple questions come for, through, and first, um, could you define mitigation in the sense of hazard disclosure? Hi, Shelby, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Good. I still have the presentation playing in my ear. In my, ear. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> yes, we Can you ask that first question again, please? Um, could you define the uh, mitigation and the sense of hazard disclosure for realtors? So I did a research. Um, I used the uh, National Realtors Association research as well as, just a moment. There we go. I can mute myself in my ear. 
So the National Realtors Association did a study, but they did it as a counter study to the map that was shown. The map that was shown had all of those states in red as no disclosure, but the Realtors Association did a counter study and found that every state does have mitigation disclosure, but it varies. It can just say, are you aware of a flood risk or are you aware of any risks, but it varied state to state as to what those mitigation disclosures were. Great. Thank you. Um, another question is based on your survey, why did citizens not learn flood risk um, from local officials or their insurance agent? So that was a good question. I was actually very surprised that insurance agents were never um, brought up. Um, I had to be taught um, to do this research, not to lead those questions and ask about that, but it never once came up as coming from their insurance. But if you consider that they one weren't considering flood risk, then why would they be speaking to an insurance agent about flood risk? Um, I know in my personal experience, having recently purchased a home, that was never brought up as something to even look into. And when I asked, because that's my living and that was my research, <laughs> I had to go to another agent and that agent was asking me questions I couldn't answer about the house I was about to purchase. So um, bottom line, they didn't hear about insurance from um, flood insurance from their insurance agents and they never brought it up. Okay, thank you. Um, next, let's see. How did you recruit your participants for the survey and how many were interviewed? So great question. So this was a sample study, a pilot study, um, and I recruited them by word of mouth, actually. I had friends in Houston who had um, flooded in the large, very large flood that had happened there. And I assumed that I would be able to word of mouth, just talk to all their neighbors and I would have this huge pool. What happened was all those neighbors had moved. And so um, they, one of, they tried to reach to one of their former neighbors, including my friends who had moved, um, but no one would talk to me. And so I reached a little further into my emergency management forums, and I reached a little further to friends and family where areas were flooding. I did want to try and get across the United States, so I had 14%. 14 participants. Again, it was a small study, 14 or 15, but I did hit nine states. Um, so we did have that area, but it was, it was word of mouth is how I had to recruit them. And I am also interesting. Some, uh, I had some preachers actually talk about my research and try and help me recruit. And I had some people that did not want to speak to me. And my assumption was the flooding was too risk and it was too painful for them to talk about. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's see. Next, um, how did you get the Real Estate Association and lobbyists to buy in to potentially educating realtors to make them responsible? So I did not get those buy-ins. I studied okay. and found that through an internet <laughs> search. I will tell you, I did speak with a couple of real estate agents. One of them was a friend of mine, another was a family member. Um, and they were very keenly interested in the research and wanted that information. But I was told by one agent, um, what we don't know, we don't have to say. But they also have the legal liability of they can't disclose something that the seller hasn't disclosed to them. Mm -hmm. So there are limitations there for those agents. All right. And then our last final question, um, did any of your research potentially trigger um, a standard in high school education for blood risk? So, so great, a great question. Um, we call those social vulnerability factors. And actually one of the qualifying factors was they had to have at least a high school education. We started with a bachelor's education, but we found that some were, especially the older folks, didn't necessarily have a high school education. So we qualified them a little bit further to ask them profession. So everyone had at least a high school education and all of them had careers. And we also asked income. And all shared their income. We gave a range, uh, except for one who, again, was uncomfortable sharing her income. But uh, yeah, it was uh, the social vulnerability factors we tried to eliminate the education and the income specifically by these um, participants. Okay, well, that's great. And that's going to conclude our Q&A session with Miss Friend. If y'all have continued questions for her, please reach out as they come to mind. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Simmons, the Science Director at Nurture Nature Center located in Easton, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to be talking to you today about communicating uncertainty and risk in flood forecasts, uh, specifically how probabilistic information can affect decision making. And I'll be speaking on behalf of my co-authors, Rachel Hogan Carr and Carrie Maxfield with the Nurture Nature Center, and Dr. Burl Montz with East Carolina University. So just to give you some context, our prior research has extended all the way back to 2012. Uh, we have been focusing on understanding flood forecasts and warning tools and how even though they provide this wealth of information, people don't often respond the way that they should in order to protect life and property when a storm system is imminent and flooding is likely. And as uh, a past partner, Gary Spitzkowski, once said, you know, what we need is to learn how to package and communicate this information effectively so that people can understand it and take the right action when they need to. So to that end, we've done a number of studies. We focused on riverine flood forecast products in Easton, Pennsylvania and Lambertville, New Jersey, coastal flood forecast products in Ocean and Mammoth counties in New Jersey, and then the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast System, HEFS, which is a relatively new product, in Jefferson County, West Virginia, and Frederick County, Maryland. All of our studies have been funded by NOAA, as well as our current one, which is funded by NOAA OER. The objective of this current study is to really look at how probabilistic hydrologic forecast information is understood by various audiences, how they use it or might use it, and how it will affect their decision making. We focused on three forecast products, the Advanced Hydrologic Prediction System, or AHAPS. Many of you might know it as just the hydrograph. The Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast Service, HEFS, which you're seeing there to the right, that's an example, one from New York. And then briefings, which are used for impact-based decision support. We're looking at how these various products can work together to convey information about certainty and uncertainty related to these forecasts and how we can change the visual display formats to better enhance the public and professional understanding of the information that needs to be conveyed. Our approach with this specific project was to expand our geographic focus. So we worked with river forecast centers and weather forecast offices across uh, the, the country. We worked in California, Colorado, and New York. And we employed a mixed method approach where we used focus groups that were scenario based, and I'll explain that more in a bit, surveys and interviews. So the focus group approach that we employ um, basically develops this hypothetical scenario that we lead participants through and we ask them questions along the way to gauge their understanding of the information that's being conveyed and also what types of information they want at different periods leading up to an event, their understanding and motivation to take action, would they share that information, all that type of really rich context we get in these focus groups. So what we did was we held two rounds of in-person focus groups. Round one, we held in Eureka, California, Gunnison, Colorado, Durango, Colorado, and Owego, New York in spring 2019. We held two focus groups in each location, one residential and one professional. And then we took the information that we gathered from those focus groups. We revised uh, the probabilistic product, the HEFS, and I'll show you examples of this shortly. And we tested again in the fall of 2019. Now the participants were completely different in round one and round two. And we also asked the participants to complete surveys before and after each of the two hour focus groups that we held. So we had both quantitative and qualitative information. The focus group transcripts were analyzed using NVivo and the survey responses were analyzing using Excel. More recently, we completed an online survey where we sent um, revised products to all of those who completed round one and round two with our final product revisions, as well as a national product prototype 
that we were testing the various elements that we gathered from the different regions. That study, the, the final survey of the online survey is not yet completed, um, but please keep your eyes peeled for those findings when we have them out. We hope to have a final report um, later in the summer, and then we're going to be working on transitioning some of these recommendations to operations with our partners at the National Weather Service in NOAA. So what we did during a focus group is we had Dr. Burl Mons lead the participants. We would limit them to 15 total participants, and we would compensate them for their time, at least the residential audiences we did. And we would give everybody an iPad so that they could follow along in the scenario, zoom in to products that they needed to if it was hard to see. And we walked them through an Esri story map, which you're seeing an example of the beginning of one there on the right. So each scenario was customized for the region that we were having the focus group in. This one that you're seeing here was Gunnison, and we had a high snowpack and possible flood scenario. And we would vary it from a month to several weeks before the event, depending on the location, and lead them up to the actual event, showing them various products along the way to give them context and asking them questions about their understanding and their motivation to take action. Our aims for what we are trying to answer with this study are shown in these research questions. We were really focusing on this difference between probabilistic and deterministic information, how timing of that information affects people's understanding and motivation to take action, if there were varying levels of confidence that were across the different forecast types, the different geographic regions, um, especially because they have different contexts for flooding and different uh, situational awareness of what flood forecast product information is out there. We wanted to understand if there were changes in the forecast probabilities over time as you get closer to the event, how that affects user confidence. And we focused a lot on the display needs for these products and how they varied across the different users. And then importantly, from a previous study that we did, we, we found that there, if there was a difference between the deterministic AHAPS product and the probabilistic HEFS product, so basically the median line of the HEFS was different from the black line, this is what our deterministic forecast is with the AHAPS, it would cause a lot of confusion among the users and cause them to basically distrust both. We wanted to test that more fully in this study. So we're looking at how those can be presented simultaneously without causing confusion and what information needs are there for the users with these two types of different forecast information. Since we gathered a lot of really rich information from the focus groups, I just wanna highlight a few key takeaways here before I jump into some of the quantitative survey results. We found that there is a challenge to effectively communicating serious impacts, especially to uh, the lay person who may not be as familiar or as concerned with uh, flooding or severe weather events. We had one resident in Owego who basically said, you know, I'm gonna still be playing my video games. You need to get my attention in a, in a better way. You need to make it more simple and maybe more cartoony. I'm, not, I'm just not gonna pay attention. We had another resident in Colorado who, you know, had, you know, personal bias against math. And so when we started talking about the river and these numbers, she's like, hey, I thought we were talking about the river and whether it's going to flood or not. Now you're asking me to do math with all these probabilities. There's also a need to understand um, past performance issues and trust issues. In Owego, for instance, in 2011, this, this person didn't prepare there was a major flooding event, but in prior cases, when she had listened to warnings, nothing happened. So that time around in 2011, she didn't do anything because she didn't think it was a serious risk, and, and, it, and it was. Briefings were really highly valued. They provided context that was not there in just a single graphic. Residents, especially in Colorado, said, you know, if I just saw this one graphic, I really wouldn't know what to make of it. Um, you know, getting just bits and pieces of information. Often they didn't know where to get the information, and when they were presented all together, they they just, it's like, I have to make this conclusion and synthesis myself. 
I'm not going to do that. If you provide it together in a context with a summary, with impacts, I'm much more likely to understand the information and to take action. So I want to focus on one survey question where we asked the participants after the focus group to discuss their perceptions of usefulness of the various products that we showed them. And I'm going to focus on Eureka, California uh, in the interest of time. But what you're seeing here is a grid of all of the different products that they showed them, that we showed them throughout the course of the scenario. So we started with a forecast summary, observed precipitation, a hydrograph, and then this probability of stage is what we were calling their HEFS. So the HEFS is not yet a standardized product. There's not a national product that, that's in the works. And so this is a regional version of that. And so from round one to round two, you can see that there are significant differences. Round one is there on your left, and you can see the bright color bars that are indicating the exceedance probability over the five-day time period that is shown in this graph. And there on the right is our round two product that we developed after taking into consideration our analysis of the focus group transcripts and survey, and also some best practices related to graphical design. We brought out and simplified the title. We highlighted the exact location. So those are central pieces of information that everyone is looking for that you could see there. We added this forecaster's note, that yellow bar at the top, to provide a very concise one sentence summary of what is the critical piece of information to take away. There on the right, you're seeing that five-day chance of river level exceedance that was originally shown in the bars across. And we put this into a vertical table that was easier to understand. You can see we noted the flood stage and monitor stage so you could really understand the probabilities related to the flood stages. Those stages are also shown on the main graph, and these are the hourly river level probabilities. And then you can see the shading related to percentages that are beyond, behind that official forecast in the black line. So what was the difference that was resulted from these changes? What you're seeing here is the professionals' ratings of usefulness of all of the products that they saw from round one to round two, so the difference. And I'm pointing out the, the significant difference that I want to highlight here is that that probability of stage increased. The, those who said that they found that product to be extremely or very useful increased from round one to round two. So this is really a positive finding that's showing that the changes that we made were effective in making the product more useful. The same is found in the residents. Uh, you can see that there is an increase in those who found it extremely to very useful in round two compared to round one. This is Durango, Colorado. You're seeing the original product that uh, we got from the RFC there on the left. And on the right is our revised product that we tested in round two. Again, note that we really clearly label the title in a very common language um, that is easy for all to understand. We put the location right up front and the time frame, so those are easy to see. We shaded observed first forecast on the main graph so you can see those differences, and the different flood levels are marked. The other thing of note in this product is that we added a interactive feature where you can hover your mouth mouse over a point on the graph and get this line and text box that pops up with the USGS historical river levels. We added this because the USGS is a product that a lot of people use in Colorado in this region. And they wanted to know, well, how does this projected flood level or this river level relate to you know historical averages? And so we added this piece of information here as a as a pop-up, a text pop-up. Looking at the differences here in Durango, it was a really positive finding that the probability product increased in usefulness from round one to round two. 
This is for the professionals. And the same happened for the residents. Remember again, those in round one and round two were different people. They were not the same people. This is Omigo, New York. So you're seeing their original HEFS there on the left, and then the revised product that we tested in round two on the right. We kept the 10-day river level probabilities uh, as a title. We highlighted the location. We included that forecaster's note there in purple. We used a different shading mechanism here. So we have the most likely in yellow, and that goes from 25 to 75%. And then we have the 5% and 95% lines, the river level certainty lines that are pulled out. We wanted to test this against the shaded probability to see if this would be more intuitive to people. We found that there was some confusion in understanding a range like 10 to 90%. And then we also had the percent chance of river liver exceedance box there on the right, similar to Eureka. This is just a 10 day river level probability as opposed to the five day that we had in Eureka. And then Gunnison was very similar to Durango. Uh, we had a different scenario, but the product uh, design looks very similar, and we had the USGS historical river levels there as well. As I mentioned initially, one of our main focuses was really understanding this interplay between the probabilistic and deterministic products. And you can see we included both on all of these revised products. So you're seeing that deterministic here in the black line, and then the probabilistic is behind. We wanted to see what happens when they're different. So here you're seeing a difference right about here around the Friday mark um, on June 6th, where the deterministic, the black line, dips well below the mean of the median of the probabilistic forecast. These differences relate because they're different forecasts. They're using different inputs. So what happens when they're different? Well, we asked people, what does this affect? And there were some that said that having a difference made them less confident in both the probabilistic and deterministic. Some had less confidence in the deterministic. Quite a few more said they were less confident in the probabilistic. But overall, the majority said that they would seek out more information or ask an expert, which is a positive finding that allows us to understand going forward, it's OK if there's differences. We just need to explain it and provide resources for understanding. You can see we pulled out some quotes up there at the upper right. You know, there were some that said, you know, having a difference didn't really make me question the graph. It made me question the forecast. And there were others who were like, I, I don't like this. Why are they so different? So we really need to understand how to communicate why things are different to the public and, and provide that right there on the graph, maybe as an information box. We wanted to see what the change was from round one to round two to see if having a product that was easier to understand would change what that reaction was, and it did. So here you're seeing the difference from round one to round two. There's a quite a, uh, almost a quarter decrease in the, among the residents and professionals and those who said that they found less confidence in the probabilistic which means that they're under, how we are interpreting it is that they understand the probabilistic more. And it looks like the majority of those move to having less confidence in both the probabilistic and deterministic. Um, so it's, it, it does make an impact, but um, there's still a role to play here to increase understanding. So to summarize, you know, overall, people really valued being a part of this process. They learned a lot from participating in the focus groups. They felt like their contribution was really valued and, and they liked to be a part. Uh, but we also found that there is a tremendous value in educating people how to understand forecasts. This isn't always a priority. You know, it takes a lot of work and it isn't always rewarding, but it does possibly save lives in the end. So here's some quotes that pull out that they really get at that point. So in a week ago, they had a major flooding event in 2011 and the National Weather Service um, 
forecasters came out and did multiple presentations to the community. And that was perceived very positively. They felt that it was real and heartfelt, like they really cared about them and they remembered it, you know, almost eight years later when they're talking to us about it. In Colorado, they, they want to know, they, they, they recognize that they need to learn how to access that information and understand it and what to do once they get that information. Um, they, they know that they need to learn to change with what the graphic tells them, but they need the information to be able to do that. So what we found so far, and this is still preliminary, um, we will have our final report later this summer, but we found that those proposed revisions to the graphics that I showed you did increase utility and comprehension. And um, we did focus in on specific elements to pull out for developing a national prototype product that we will report on more in the final report. We found that the addition of the forecaster's note, that colored bar at the top with a quick, concise summary, was very positively received and helpful. And that the percent chance of exceedance table to the right was also seen as useful. There is a difference between the regions in forecast awareness and utility. Some, like Owego, were very forecast aware and uh, felt that the information was useful. They knew their forecasters, many of them did. Uh, whereas in Colorado, people were more uh, focused on other products like the USGS. Interactivity was valued when we gave them the ability to add or, or take off layers of additional information that was useful. And then we found that there was a lot of interest in understanding more about the context in their area. So what's happening upstream and downstream? Is the flood pulse coming down? When is it coming? So they wanted to be able to view multiple forecast points at any given time, side by side. Now, there was a lot of interest from professionals and also some residential audiences about what is driving these models. Uh, what the inputs were. We got a lot of questions. Does this consider the dam operations? Does this consider the snowpack? And so having all of that information in a way that is not in their face, but available easily through, you know, a, a button on the graph that directs them to these are what the inputs to the model would definitely be helpful. Especially for residents, the historical perspective is highly valued. They want to know, you know, how does this compare to 2011 or the past event where I know that there was a serious impact and they should have listened. Also, past model performance. Does this model, has it accurately predicted past events so that I know that I can trust its performance going forward? As I mentioned before, briefings are very useful. Um, having a short summary first and the details later was seen as critical because there are many who would just look at the first page. So briefings are usually sent in a PDF format by email. And so if you have that first page, like here's the summary, this is what we predict going forward. Um, and then explanations and graphs um, after that so that those who want more information can get them is, is key. And then importantly, this divergence between the probabilistic and deterministic does create questions. They are different models um, and having them together can challenge the understanding of the viewer. But having this additional information from uh, the probabilistic forecast is valued by both the residents and professional audience members that we have queried in our study. And they just want more information and to be able to understand it and access it easily. So I know that there's a lot of information and I'm sure that there's questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, this is our website. If you go to Focus on Floods, there's a lot more about our past research as well as what we're doing now. And I thank you for your time. That was really informative and thorough um, presentation that you presented us with. And we have a handful of questions um, to ask you. So we're just gonna get started. Um, what drove the different colors used in the forecaster's note in different locations? So we have those correspond to the flood level colors that are used on the hydrograph. Okay. And uh, okay. Um, let's see. Next. 
what tools provide information um, closer to the observed data, the validation platform? And what demographics were your um, So the, sorry. Um, it's okay. <laughs> My connection is a little in and out, so it's gonna um, happen. <laughs> so the um, the ATFS is currently run at certain uh, river forecast points, um, and it's it's they're transitioning to a national product. But right now, it's just different regional uh, river forecast centers that are operating the the model. Okay, um, what is the main difference between deterministic and probabilistic approach? Um, the latter that includes the uncertainties. Was this explained during the survey? Yes. So most of our um, of our study involved focus groups, and we were able to walk people through the different products and explain to them this is probabilistic. This is what it's showing them. Um, and then when they took the follow up survey, they would have that information. And then our online survey, which also asks about those questions were sent to the same people that we had in the focus group. So everybody were, should have been on the same page for the deterministic and probabilistic. Okay, great. Um, did you find that respondents generally understood how the forecasts at a gauge related to the potential impacts of their home or property? So in, pl in places where it's flood prone, people know their gauge, they know the levels, <laughs> they have that number <laughs> memorized. Um, right. And a lot of times they are more trusting of just going out and looking at the river or, you know, putting a stick in the ground so that they can monitor <laughs> it. So it's, it's trying to translate that knowledge into um, being able to look at these forecasts and, and trust those forecasts and use them to plan ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, does your tool provide information at all stream gauges or only the ones that coincide with the river forecast points? At this time, it's just the river forecast points, but I think that there's a plan to make that um, be, have a. Okay. Um, did you get a sense that your participants understood the variability of flooding from a single event, um, different watersheds, etc.? Yes, I, when we were showing them the product, there were a what is happening upstream or downstream. So one of the revisions that we put into the product is to have um, a, a toggle button at the top where you could just move to the gauge that immediately upstream or downstream so you could see what was happening throughout the whole watershed. And there were also some requests to have a, a map where you could just pull up uh, the different points. Okay, great. Well, that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you, Kate, for your presentation. Um, next, we're going to move into the problemistic risk analysis to support informed decision making. Um, that's going to be brought to us by Seth Lawyer, um, computational scientist with Dewberry, and then Sam Lehman with USGS. All right, hi, this is uh, Will Lehman and uh, Seth Lowler. We're, we're gonna be presenting to you on uh, probabilistic flood risk analysis to support risk-informed decision-making. Um, we've been working really hard on, on this presentation and we're really excited to bring it to you. Uh, Seth, why don't you go ahead and show them the Git repo we created for this. Sure. Let me take the screen for a moment. So we we put the presentation, the slides, and the content and some of the demo materials on a GitHub repo, and you can see on your screen it's here at github.com Dewberry ASFPM 2020. And this has the slideshow, so if you link down here, here is a link to the slideshow that we're doing. Um, and that'll be available. And then all the code for everything we're using is on here as well. There's Jupyter Notebooks that have a uh, demonstration um, for this presentation then some other things. And it can be launched using this button, Launch Binder. So if you click that, if you go to the repo and click that, 
a Jupyter Notebook instance will be created on the cloud and it will have all the libraries you need inside. And you can play this um, with all the code that we're going to show you today live at any point. Cool. So I'm going to take presentation back and start working through the slides. We're, we're wanting to try to show some of the ideas behind um, what a probabilistic modeling system would look like. So to, to get to that notion, we started with uh, trying to define a deterministic system. So the definition we, were, we came up with together was that a deterministic system has no randomness at all, and for a given input, there's a known output. So the, the big takeaway is for a given input, there's a single output, right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a really useful model. Um, it's how we do business in most of the, the water resources um, science. So if you think about the 100-year rainfall, we create a deterministic model of that, and we produce a flow through some sort of basin model. That basin model flow can be then passed on to a deterministic um, hydraulics model, like HEC RAS, to come up with what the depth grids are throughout the floodplain. And then from that, we can create a, a damage estimate. So for the 100-year rainfall, we're able to produce a damage estimate based off of deterministic inputs and outputs from each of the models in the system. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, a great tool to make. Um, but one of the questions we should be asking ourselves is, um, first of all, do we know what the 100-year flow is? Uh, do we know what the 100-year rainfall is? And how are we certain that the 100-year rainfall will produce the 100-year flow? So we make the assumption that if we model the 100-year rainfall, that that produces the 100-year damages, which is a, really a, a pretty bad assumption. So that's why we, we'd like to kind of to talk about that in a broader sense. Uh, one of the things that I, I kind of mentioned was that we, we don't really know uh, what the 100-year rainfall is. And here, here we have um, a deterministic flow frequency curve. This is flow, not precipitation. And, and uh, Fess uh, built this chart out of the Jupyter Notebooks that we have. And this chart is based off of a gauge record of flow. And I guess the question I'd have for you, Seth, is, What's 100 year flow on this guy? Um, it looks like we've got one that's close. So the 0.01 is going to be the 1%. And what's that? It so looks like it's about 400,000 CFS or so. This is the Potomac River at Little Falls. And it looks like we're very close. It's probably a 90 year event. Yeah. So, so. If you count all the black dots, these are the annual maximums of, of every year in our, in our period of record. And there are 89 of them. It's not, not just 90, it's, it's 89. So one over 89 is the, actually one over 90 would be the, the plotting position of this black point here, which is just shy of a 100 year. So even with 90 years of record, we still can't really say if we know what the 100 year flow is. Um, if we were to trust this log Pearson type three distribution, then we could pull the value based off of the uh, log Pearson distribution. But if you notice here, the 100-year flow is computed by the log Pearson type 3 is actually less than a flow that we observed in the last 89 years. So from a statistics standpoint, which one is truth? And we, we don't really know. And the reason we don't know is because we have, we have a, a limited period of observation that we're, we're looking at here. So we'd, we'd like to kind of demystify what that means and how we can deal with that um, through this presentation. So as opposed to a, a, a deterministic system, a probabilistic system allows for, for a given input and a set of random variables that represent the initial conditions of a system, we can produce a distribution of outputs. This distribution of outputs is really helpful in helping us to understand what we can know and what we cannot know about a system. So if we were to take that previous example of a system of deterministic models and convert it into a system of, of probabilistic models, what we would do is we would take 
a whole bunch of probabilistic models and for that 100 year peak rainfall depth produce a distribution of, of probabilistic flows from that based off of a variety of different initial conditions, whether the ground is wet or dry, the shape of that event looks like. And likewise, we put that, if we use the same deterministic flow as we used before, we could get a whole variety of different stages. And realistically, there could be a, a variety of flows coming out of the upstream model here. But, but for so, that deterministic flow we initially started with, we could see a distribution of stages. Yeah. So I think we can see, well, it just occurred to me that how this balloon. So if we go back one slide. So here we're taking rainfall over different conditions and they're each producing something. And then each one of those could be one of the singular arrows that goes into the flow on the next slide, right? Yeah, it's a computational nightmare. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's a great observation. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem, right? And then, and then from that, well, what are the damages? Well, we've got a whole variety of damages that could happen for a conditional depth. So the question might be, well, how do, how do we deal with that? And, and what's, that, what's, that, what's that mean? Um, well, we, we want to talk about that a little bit more and what tools are out there for us to be able to talk about that. So um, previously, we kind of talked about the notion that we, we don't really know what the 100-year flow is. Um, again, Seth, he, he took this, this idea that we had and he built a Jupyter notebook that helps us to, to be able to compute some really cool graphics to help us talk about this, this problem. And uh, I think now is about the time that we want to do this, but the objective here is to talk about our uncertainty in what the 100-year flow might be and how the period of record of observe, observations we have impact our ability to predict what the 100-year flow would be. I guess the screen's yours now. All right. So let's take a look at a notebook. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Jupyter, it's just a um, computing environment that, that looks and feels like a web page. And so this is an example of a notebook where there's a lot of code in here, but don't um, uh, I don't think that the intent is to look at the code. Just understand that we can very quickly start changing things. So as Will and I developed this, uh, I would put something in and maybe plot it, and Will would say, no, let's let's change something up there. And so the Jupyter Notebook is, is a good way to do that. Um, so I'm going to load my libraries. And hopefully it will start. It's been, we've had it dormant, so I'm going to restart, and hopefully it starts back up. Kernel restarted, library. So now we're going to go to a gauge. I mentioned this, the Potomac River, and it's in Maryland. And so this is going to go right now and retrieve the information from the USGS. You can see I pulled it into a table, and this column right here is what we're interested in, peak values. So let's take a look first at this flow. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. So. These are the years of record. This should look familiar for anyone that's used a uh, looked at USGS peak flow records on the uh, on a station website, and you can see this was that near 100 percent or 1 percent or 100 year flow that we talked about. Um, and so when we were looking over this, we'll like, well, I want to look at one of these years, right? So can you just take just pick one set and let's plot it? So we did that. We look at 1996. That's going to be this this flow right here. We can read that in and plot that up, and you can see here's the 96 event. Now, what jumped out to Will when I showed him that was this one, this peak here. And so, if you can figure out where that is, so it's about a 250,000 CFS event. If we go back up here. We can redraw this with that line and see how many there were. There were very actually three, four, five. There were six above 250,000. So this water year just happened to have two extreme events, um, and one one gets counted. So 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 go back up there. So so for 1996, we had 
two peaks, one of which is almost, you know, there's only six observations that are bigger than it, but it didn't even count in our number of observations because we're using annual maximum. That's right. And well, how some many years, times did that happen? <laughs> that's not good. It's a good question. <laughs> we can look at a different year. So the red line hasn't changed, but but look at the events here. So that's that's extreme on the other end, which we don't really we don't typically look at the for for the analysis the um, the drought years, right? We're interested in the big flows, but you can see the the stark difference between the flows. Um, during a drought and during a, a rainy a rainy year. That's wild. So, why don't you talk about what we're doing here, Will? This you know, if you if you scroll up there a little bit, Seth, and and go back to the plot where we had all of the the blue dots. But if you take all of these blue dots and and all you do is you just shift them over to the uh, to the far side of the screen in order of, of their their height what you can do is you can rank them and that's that's building an empirical cdf so it's, it's a really simple way of of sorting our data to try to make sense of the data that we have so this is a really cool plot here we can see what the exceedance likelihood is of every observation that we had um, and, and from that, we can start to think about fitting numerical statistical models. So a common way of trying to do that is to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, the skew, um, and, and to be able to start to think about, well, what is, what's, the, what's the way that we want to describe this in a numerical model? So these, these values here I pulled from the... SGS gauge station. These are the regional skew and the mean squared error, which you're going to find on any uh, available on a map from the USGS to, to look at that stuff. And so here's our log mean because we're doing log Pearson. So there's log of the mean as uh, uh, 5.07. There's the standard deviation and the skew. And these are what we need to do to, to use to calculate log Pearson type threes. So you want to take this, Will? Yeah. So, so as we talked about before, we had a, a. This is our. This represents our best estimate log Pearson type three distribution based off of the data that we had. Um, you know, the the problem with that is that it's our best estimate, and we don't know whether or not we've observed enough of the period of record to be able to accurately describe that. I asked Seth kind of uh, earlier if if he knew what the 100 year flow was and he said well if we believe the line then then this is what it's going to be but let's look at let's look at our data next to this line again and we can see that that our data doesn't necessarily follow that line so by creating that numerical model with the log pearson type 3 distribution we've introduced some model error into into our system um, and so so we don't really know what the 100 year flow is and we, we know that we've introduced a little bit of error, but um, what we don't see is the error that's produced by us having a limited uh, period of record. So one way to really try to describe what the limited period of record does to our uncertainty is to produce a bootstrap. And a bootstrap is a really fan fancy way of describing uh, sampling with replacement. So that all we're doing is we're taking that bag of, of observed flows that we have, and we're grabbing out 89 flows, and we're doing that each time to create a new empirical CDF based off of a subsample of our sample. And from that, we can infer our ability to describe the population to determine how uncertain we are about what the flows in the river would be. So let's see one of those bootstraps. So this, these red dots are not our observed values, but rather a, a sample of those observed values where maybe we observed some of these smaller flows more than once, um, and then we replotted it. And this looks actually like it fits a little bit better than the previous one did. Let's see what so happens what we do when we... Go ahead. Yeah, let's Sorry, see what happens well, when we do two. 
Yeah, that's, that's right. There we go. But see, there's a little bit of spread still. And, and what we want to do is we want to get a, an idea of how big that spread could be. So what we can do is we can do many bootstraps on top of each other, and that will give us confidence intervals around the, the uncertainty we have for the flow at any given probability range. Oh. So this wants me to create a bunch, but we have this live image. Just go to the live image. Yep. Here, I'll, I'll just take over. Perfect. So uh, that didn't work. So here, here we have that live image again, and, and you can see the bootstraps as we add more uh, bootstraps, you can see the count of how many bootstraps we have. We'll start with one, we'll add two, and as we add more and more, the error bands start to fill out. We, got to, we start to be able to see how much uncertainty there is in our, in our data set due to the limited sample size. And 89 years is a lot of years um, to have in a historic data set. Um, but yet you still see that there's a tremendous amount more error introduced by the limited sample size than there is due to the numerical fit of the log Pearson type 3. Um, this is really important because this uncertainty can govern how well we can describe the risk in an area. So um, what we can do, you know, you know, Seth talked earlier about how he could see how this, this problem starts to explode really quickly as we try to incorporate all of these different uncertainties from all of these different systems in together and how many runs it would take to, to span the space. So uh, you might be questioning, how do you, how do you do that? And how do you do it in a reasonable amount of time? Um, so, so there's a tool out there um, called HEC Watt and these slides are, are, uh, are pictures to help us understand how that thing works. Um, but what we use is we use a event sampling Monte Carlo, which is just a really fancy way of saying we're combining these de deterministic models together with randomized inputs uh, for the boundary conditions, and we're sampling that in space so that we can create statistical summaries. So what you see is, you know, that red line comes in, that's our bootstrap, and then from that bootstrap, we pull a singular event off of that bootstrap, we model it with uncertainty in HEC RAS to describe Manning's in or bridge peers. And then we take that flow uh, or stage and we, we drop it into our consequence assessment tool like HEC FIA to compute damages for that particular watershed. And then that's a damage amount. And that's one event. We want to do that lots and lots of times to come up with a damage frequency curve that we can integrate underneath to compute an expected annual damage. Now, if we do that for multiple bootstraps, kind of like we saw before, we see, oops, I went one too many. All these bootstraps, this is like a thousand bootstraps in the end. If we do that for a thousand bootstraps, then we've described our knowledge uncertainty, each one resulting in an expected annual damage. And we want to be able to turn that into a distribution of expected annual damages. So at the end of this slide, you see a little distribution being built to say this describes our best estimate of expected annual loss, and then the distribution about it. Now, a lot of people, when they create an expected annual loss, they show the, the, the natural variability range in damage estimates per year. And that's a very, per return interval, that's a very different thing than expressing the, the uncertainty we have in our estimate of EAD. Um, so our objective is to describe our uncertainty in EAD. So here you can see that distribution being built here. What we want to do is give a best estimate for EAD and then our, express our uncertainty that, that that relationship is true. All right? And there are all kinds of other decision metrics that are out there that we need to be able to capture and, and use to help inform um, decision-making processes. So, uh, you know, here I've got, I've got a picture of, of some fictitious depth grids that are interacting with a levy and, and a structure, and we're recording them in an event database to be able to know how many times a cell gets wet. If we count how many times a cell gets wet and divide by the total number of events, 
that can be our best estimate. Expected uh, average annual uh, exceedance probability, AEP grid. All right. So here's, here's a study area that we have. The study area has a really large levied area with two breaches in it. Um, what we did was we created a graphical frequency curve for the water coming down the, the river uh, with different shape sets for different flow amounts going through. Um, here's uh, the bootstrapped flows that we created in the watt. Uh, we ran this on uh, my computer at home over a weekend. It only took about a weekend to compute about 10,000 events. Each event, we recorded how many times every cell got wet, and we were able to produce for that a number of times wet grid. And this reflects how many times wet is. So, so I guess, Seth, I'd ask you, you know, we might have a levy here, and that levy might have a design criteria of the 200 year, but does every cell behind that area get wet the same number of times? I'm guessing no. It, it doesn't, right? We've got this variation in here. And that variation yep. is due to the volume of overtopping that happens, whether or not breaches occur. A lot of these system dynamics of things that we don't know when they will happen, um, all being integrated in together in the system. Uh, well, it's not just that, though, right? It's also the flow and all the other different random elements that we that we sampled ahead of time in this in this plot. Yep. That's correct. All of those systems are operating together. Their deterministic inputs being routed through with uncertainty in their boundary conditions. That's the objective. If we divide each one of those cells by the total number of events, we're able to get an AEP grid to describe the likelihood of any cell getting wet. The interesting thing here, you can see that these cells here are much more likely to get wet than any other cells, and that's right where that upstream breach occurs. So that's an interesting artifact out of this grid. Likewise, we can keep that tr we can keep track of that at the structure level and count how many times a structure gets wet and divide by the total number of events and see that not all structures get flooded the same amount. And we can compute expected annual losses for every single structure to compute our best estimate of what the damage would be at that and a distribution about what those damages could be. Um, for any given year. So that's kind of what we wanted to show. We think that those types of things are really valuable for making decisions because what we're doing is we're not just expressing our best estimate, but also the range of uncertainty that we have in those estimates so that we can make educated decisions to manage that risk. Um, you know, my, my takeaway will from this process and, and doing probabilistic studies, it's um, the, those first couple of charts you showed where you show that the same rainfall can can result in vastly different flooding, right? Depending on initial conditions. And if it's been raining or if it's been dry or if some random thing happens like a culvert getting blocked and, and flow gets routed to or away from your, from your home, um, when you think about how many different things like that can happen along the process in the system as you describe it, it really shows the the value and the import of doing this and, and getting it right. Um, so I really enjoyed doing this with you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I guess one question I have for you is a lot of people tell me, you know, well, it takes too much time to do those uncertainty analysis. I guess one of the things that I observed was that you took that gauge record, pulling it in into that Jupyter notebook and converted it into a bootstrap of possible flows in what, an evening? Um, yeah. Your ability to be able to look at uncertainty um, is a lot faster than trying to make sure that we get that single parameter right. Because the, trying to get that single parameter right is an enormous amount of work, whereas really just truly expressing our uncertainty due to limited data um, is a lot easier to do and a lot more truthful. It's kind of something I think about this. Yeah, and and, and like you said, with with computational tools now, it's easy. We can do, we just did 10,000 bootstraps in a minute or less than a minute preparing for this. We, you know, we can go through this process now. So um, I think that's what I have. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for doing this with me, Seth. All right. We'll, uh, I guess we'll take questions after the, after the presentation, whenever the, uh, whenever the show is aired. Thanks everybody. 
Seth and William, that was a very informative presentation and we do have some questions um, to answer. So we're to get started. Um, did your bootstraps use confidence intervals or prediction intervals for the Monte Carlo simulation? So, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, okay. Yeah, so you know, what the purpose of a bootstrap is, uh, is to produce confidence intervals. So the bootstrap itself actually creates the confidence intervals by expressing our uncertainty to no base of our limited period of record. Okay. Um, how were the sweep flows determined and um, used in the probabilistic approach? I think I have to take that one too. So, so in, in the particular case study that we did, uh, we used bootstrap flows based off of an empirical distribution uh, as a regulated, a regulated frequency curve out of uh, the upstream dam. Okay. And they were routed through HEC RAS. Okay. Um, would a sensitivity analysis be redundant or complementary to the problemistic analysis? Yeah, I'll keep going. Um, so so the, <laughs> the sensitivity analysis would be great as a pre-process. What we would want to do is we'd want to we'd want to do sensitivity to determine which uncertainties have the most impact on our final results and select those as what we perturbate in our random sample. Okay. Um, have you performed an analysis introducing levy or dam fragility curves? Yeah, that, that particular case study we had had uh, two fragility curves on the levee system, uh, one downstream and one upstream, and sometimes one would break or the other was up to random chance. Okay. Um, and then one person has a question. Tell us one more time how to check out Jupiter. Is it to go to the exhibit hall, then Dewberry? I guess that's, I think you can do that. I also put a link on the on the um, chat bar, okay. I think you directly there. Okay, that sounds great. That looks like it concludes our questions. Great job, guys. Do y'all have anything else you'd like to add? Thanks for having me. Yep, thank you. Okay, that concludes our session today of the risk informed decision making. Um, thank you to our presenters, Tracy, Kate, Seth, and William. Um, everybody did a great job. Thanks.